Hey everybody, it's Jason Collins. For those of you who are familiar with my other YouTube channel, Papa's Woodshop, this is going to be something a little different. It's a new project that I'm taking on for 2016. My wife and I, about two and a half years ago, we started a Christian ministry program in the Dominican Republic, and we are serving children both physically and spiritually in one of the most impoverished areas down there. And one of the things, one of our goals for 2016 is to use the technology and the tools and stuff that we have been given to, to promote Christianity on the internet. Now, some of you may be familiar with some of our other work. Um, several years ago, my wife and I did a couples ministry series um, with The Love Dare and those videos are available online. And if you'd like to learn more about the Love Dare stuff, if you would like to learn more about our ongoing ministry efforts, if you would like to learn more about my woodworking projects and stuff, those videos, links to that information stuff, um, will be in the description of this video. But what I want to talk to you guys about today is I want to do a regular sort of Bible study devotional program and publish this on YouTube. I have published several um, sermons and, and teachings on different topics and stuff that I have done at area churches. I've published those on YouTube, but I want to I want to do sort of some some very specific things. And this being the first one, um, I think probably the best place for us to start with this is in Genesis because, I was recently presented with an opportunity to share some scriptural insight with some people who who profess to not believe the Bible and not believe in God. And I don't know if these are atheists or agnostic or whatever. I don't think the label that we apply to that is necessarily important. But the argument was basically, how can you expect me to believe in a loving God who would send a flood to kill almost everybody on earth. And I have to be honest with you, when I was first sort of coming into Christianity, that was one of the questions that really burned in my mind. If we look at, if we look at Jesus in the New Testament, especially in the book of John, we're presented with a loving, benevolent being. And, and, I mean, Jesus loved everyone. Jesus loved sinners, and Jesus loved prostitutes, and Jesus loved tax collectors. And really, the only people that Jesus came in contact with that he was critical and judgmental of were religious people. And I think there's a lesson to be learned in that. In, in future videos, we're going to talk about the difference between being a Christian and following Christ and being religious and, and following the, the religious constructs and stuff that, that have come from the minds and the hearts of men. But today what I want to talk about is I want to talk about this topic of how can a loving God send a flood to destroy mankind? Because in the New Testament, Jesus says, if you have seen me, you have seen my Father. Well, when we look at the picture of Jesus that we're presented with in the New Testament, again, this is love and this is charity and this is and this is helping and healing and all that. And then if we go and we look at the God of the Old Testament, it's flood and it's kill all the women and children and kill all of the animals and wipe them off the face of the earth. So when you look at that, for me anyway, and actually for a lot of people, that could be a stumbling block, right? That could be, how can I get to God if I can't get past this weird seeming disconnect between the Jesus, the God of the New Testament, and the God of the Old Testament who was sort of judgment and destruction and all that stuff. So in doing that, I think that probably the best place to start with this is to look at the pre-flood scripture that we have in Genesis. And we're going to start with Genesis chapter 6 today. And um, I'm reading out of the King James Version. And Genesis 6 and verse 1 said, 
And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them as wives all and they took them as wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. And verse four is where Genesis chapter 6 really starts to confuse people. And one of the things I want to point out is, I want you to go back and remember when you were in fourth grade. And your teacher would tell you, go home and read chapter 1, 2, and 3. And any words that you come across that you don't understand, underline them, go look up the meaning, and then write a sentence with it. And that's how we were taught to... to internalize words and concepts that we don't understand. Unfortunately, adults are not very good at following fourth grade rules. We, when we come into contact with something that we don't understand, we tend to skip over it and then use our reference bank of experience to fill in those blanks. Well, when it comes to things like scripture, that can often be cloaked in allegory and symbolism and things like that, that strategy of using what you already know to try and fill in the blanks on something that you really don't know anything about is not the best strategy in the world. We really need to dig into this and come up with a, a valid meaning for some of this stuff if we're expected to understand this. So Genesis chapter 6 and verse 4, I believe, is one of the more confusing parts of the Bible, but I also think that it's one of the most important parts of the Bible. This particular part of Genesis has been referred to as the Rosetta Stone of the Bible. And I won't get into what the Rosetta Stone is. You guys can go and, and Google that. And, and it, it, the original Rosetta Stone really opened up a lot of understanding about Egyptian language and culture and stuff like that. But using that same idea, it's very difficult, if not completely impossible, to understand the things that go on in the rest of the Old Testament, especially things like the flood and, you know, the command that God gave to King Saul, um, you know, to kill people and, and wipe out the Ammonite villages and, and things like that. It's really difficult to understand that unless you have a grasp of this. So Genesis chapter 6 and verse 4 says, There were giants in the earth in those days and also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bare children unto them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah had found grace in the eyes of the Lord, these are the many generations of Noah, and then it goes into discussing the, the lineage that followed after Noah. Now, I want to cover a couple of things, and, and I'm, again, I read that from the, from the King James Version. I want, to switch, I want to switch versions really quickly because there's an important thing here that we need to pick up on in order to fully understand what was going on during this period of time. So I'm going to switch to the New International Version, and I'm going to reread Genesis chapter 6 and verse 4. The Nephilim were in the earth in those days. That was when the sons of God went to the daughters of human beings. Children were born to them, and the Nephilim were famous heroes who lived long ago. Nephilim were also on the earth later on. Now, if we go and we do some biblical research, we're going to find two very strange groups of people. One is the Nephilim, which is referenced here, and these are these 
in the King James Version, they're called the sons of God, and in the New International Version, they are called the Nephilim. Now, we have, we have tons and tons of information that we can find extra biblical information in different documents and things where, where the Nephilim are referred to as the fallen angels. The, when, when Lucifer and his group were evicted from heaven, a certain percentage of these, a small number of these fallen angels came to earth and took on physical form. Now, we can find biblical references for how this is possible because if we look at the story of Lot, angels took on physical form and they came into um, the area of Sodom and Gomorrah. So we know that it is possible for angels to take on physical form. So this is the Nephilim, and then their offspring are referenced in other areas of the Bible as the Raphaim, okay? And the Raphaim are the children that were born from the union of the Nephilim, fallen angels who had taken human physical form and then had had children, had produced offspring with female humans. Okay, so I want to clarify that real quick. Now, we're going to go on and it says, Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5 says, The Lord saw how bad the sins of everyone on the earth had become. Now, this is probably one of the things that trips people up when they start looking at this and they go, well, God destroyed the earth because of sin. You mean to tell me that God sent a flood to destroy practically every living creature on earth because they did bad things? And this is a stumbling block for a lot of people, especially a lot of people who are looking for a reason to not trust God or looking for a reason to question scripture and stuff like that. In various translations in the Bible, it says that all of mankind had been corrupted. Okay? Now, in our modern way of thinking, when we think of the word corrupted or corruption, we think of maybe like a politician who takes bribes or, you know, maybe the mayor is, is corrupt and he gives special contracts to his brother-in-law so that they can both profit from it. Also, one of the things that we can look at to further understand this is Genesis chapter 6 and verse 12. And it says in the New International Version, God saw how corrupt the earth had become for all people on earth had corrupted their ways. If we look at the King James Version, it says, And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. Now, one of the awesome things about modern technology, and I tell people all the time, you know, we all have a device in the palm of our hand that can access the totality of human information. Okay, before, if we look at some of the writings of, like, say, the Apostle Paul, he was very interested in keeping up with his papers and his parchments and things like that. And, I mean, in order to do deep, deep biblical study, you would have to, you know, go to seminary or go to um, a library or a repository where volume after volume after volume of religious text text had been st stored, you know, different versions of the Bible, different translations of the Bible, rabbinical texts, all of these things, you would have to go and, and seriously immerse yourself in things like learning Hebrew and learning Aramaic and learning Greek and then, and then amassing all of this information. And today we can literally plug in anything that we would like to know into our phone or into our laptop computer and we have access to some of the most amazing information that you could possibly imagine. I mean today is a day unlike any other day in human history I would imagine that we have access to this stuff. So I say that to say this, we can plug into Google and we can find one of my favorite things which is an interlinear. And what an interlinear is, it takes the English translation of a 
chapter or a verse or a piece of scripture. And then it shows you side by side the English word alongside the Hebrew or Aramaic or Greek translation of that word. And that's very important because the English language is very, very limited in the descriptiveness. And a lot of words don't necessarily translate well and carry the same meaning over from one language to another. So what I like to do, anytime I find something that is that's controversial, controversial or difficult to understand, I like to go in and dig into that deeper and find out what the original words are and what the meanings and the alternate translations and things like that are. So if we look at the word corrupted in this section of Genesis, we, are, we, we find out that that word is the Hebrew word hisset, okay? And it stands for had corrupted, okay? Flesh, uh, flesh all had corrupted is the, is the section of text there. And, and if we actually look at it in, in, its, in its broader scope, okay, typically in, in Jewish law, in order for something to be accepted, all right, say as an example, if you had witnessed someone committing a crime, a theft or something like that, in order for that to be a valid accusation, you had to have two or more witnesses. So that's how Jewish law is, is set up. The interesting thing about it is the Bible is set up in a way that it follows Jewish law very closely in that when you find a, when you find a piece of scripture or you find something in the Bible, never base your theology on one verse of scripture. Always dig in. Always go and try to find at least two additional witnesses or two additional examples that say the same thing about that particular piece of scripture. You know, and as an example, when in Genesis chapter 6 it talks about there were giants in the land during that time or there were Nephilim in the land during that time, we, we could we could base our entire idea and go, yep, that's what it says, that one verse says it all, and that's all I need to know, but that's not really the responsible thing to do. We need to go and dig into the Bible further and look and see if we can find additional witnesses for that concept, and certainly we can because we know that the young King David fought Goliath, and we know that Goliath was a giant, and then we also know that when the Israelites were moving into the promised land, they were thwarted by giants and Joshua and Caleb became giant killers and, and went in and did all the things that they did. So we can find different witnesses and different references for that. I say that to tell you this. It's also very, very important in scripture when things are repeated more than one time in a short area. And, and Many of the times when Jesus was saying something that was important and he wanted people to pay attention to what he was saying, he would say, verily, verily, or truthfully, truthfully, I say unto you, or he would call Peter, Peter. He would say something twice, and that is to add emphasis to it. When something is repeated two or three times, that is an indicator that that's something that's very important. Now, the reason I say that is because as we look into this verse, and I'm looking at the direct English translation of Genesis chapter 6 and verse 12, directly translated into English. So the word order is going to be a little bit odd here, but just stick with me for a minute and you'll, you'll understand exactly why I'm saying this. God in the sight, the earth, now was corrupt on their way, flesh all had corrupted for it was corrupt now right here in this short verse we have the word corrupt okay the hebrew word hisset in its various um in its various forms whether it's past tense or or present tense 
we have three examples of this concept of corruption right here in this one verse. So that tells me from understanding how, how Jewish law is set up and the importance of repeating things and having two or three witnesses, this tells me that the, the concept of corruption in this verse is very, very important. So if we go in and we look at what does the word, what does the word corrupt mean in its original Hebrew use as it is in this particular verse. Like I said, corrupt in our modern mind sort of means bad or untrustworthy or whatever. And we're talking about so much more here than just for something to be, you know, unethical or whatever. Let's look at a couple of the meanings that I believe apply to what we're talking about here. Number one is blemished animal. Okay, and it does, in Genesis chapter 6, it talks a lot about all flesh. Not just all men and women, but every living creature had been corrupted. Okay, and a blemished animal in the, the context of the Old Testament is an animal with a birth defect, with a genetic abnormality. That is what a blemished animal typically meant in that instance. So let's keep that in mind. Let's think about corrupted in the sense in the in the context of Genesis chapter six. Let's think about corrupted as being a genetic malformation or a an abnormality in the the physical aspect of the animal. Another thing that jumps out at me when I look at the the various meanings for the word corrupted is go to ruin, laid waste, and polluted. Now, I want you to think about what was happening at that time, okay? Now, we have these fallen angels who came down from heaven with Lucifer, Satan, the devil, whatever name you'd like to use. The devil, we're told, in, in the New Testament, in the book of John, we're told that the devil comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. Now, those three words are not creative words, okay, because we know that only God has creative power. The devil, he wants to be like God, but he can't be, okay? So he knows that he can't create life. He can't create a a new species. He can't create birds of the air, fish of the sea, man. He can't create any of these things. So he's left to only be able to steal, kill, and destroy that which God has already made. And that's what the, the entire crux of this portion of the book of Genesis is trying to help us understand is that the devil and his, his minions, his fallen angels, the Nephilim, came to earth with the sole intent and purpose of corrupting, okay, of destroying that which God had created. And they did that by breeding with the, with the females, with the daughters of men. And they also did this, and this is, this is something that was, that was a huge revelation for me in understanding. They also did this with animals. Okay? They also did this with every living creature on earth. They practiced genetic manipulation with, these, with, with all of flesh. That's why when, when God looked upon the earth, and that's what we're told here, and God looked upon the earth and he saw that all of creation had been corrupted and he knew that unless something happened, unless he took immediate action, mankind would be lost. Because if you look at this, we are told that the only ones who were righteous were Noah and his family, okay? And we had at that time, we had Methuselah, we had Noah, we had Noah's wife, and we had Noah's three sons, okay? Six people out of the entire population of the earth were still genetically pure, so God went to Noah and he said, you need to build an ark 
And we're going to put all of these people on this ark to preserve humanity because I'm going to send a flood to destroy every living creature on earth. Okay? So when people look at this and they read it and they say, my goodness, how, how could you possibly believe in a God who would kill every living creature on earth? I tell people the things that were alive on the earth at that time were not what we would consider today as human beings. Their genetic code, the thing that makes them up, right? The, the very fiber of their being had been corrupted. It had been blemished. It had been destroyed. It had been ravaged. It had been spoiled. It had been laid to waste. And God looked at this and said, if I have any hope of preserving man in my image. I have to take out these people who are still genetically solid, and I have to wipe out the rest of this corruption. Okay? We're also told in Genesis that every imagination, every thought in the heart of man was continually evil. And I believe that that's because through this genetic manipulation by the Nephilim and by this, by this corruption to the core of the being, the, the model of man had been so distorted and twisted from what God had created that these creatures, and that's what I'm going to call them as creatures, these creatures were so corrupted, were so twisted that the spirit of man could not dwell within them. Okay, so basically what had happened was Satan and the Nephilim had, had corrupted the vessel of the human being to the point where the spirit of life, the life that God had breathed into Adam, the, the, the Holy Spirit, if you will, was unable to inhabit their bodies. And that caused their body to be 100% flesh, 100% fleshly driven. So the desires of of the heart, the desires of the flesh of man was so strong that it drove their ideas and their thoughts and their actions to be constantly evil. So if you could imagine a world where only six people actually had morality, okay, actually knew that they were supposed to do good and to be good and to, and to provide assistance for their fellow man and for the creatures in nature and things like that. If you could imagine that the world had been reduced to only six people who, who had a conscience or who had a heart and every other creature on earth, especially mankind, was continually evil and violent. Man, I mean, that, that, that just paints a horrible picture of the conditions that, that Noah and his family were having to endure and we have to think that Noah, it took him, depending on how you do your math and, and what, you know, what genealogy you start with, somewhere between 75 and 120 years, give or take, to build the ark. So he was having to contend with this, with this increasing amount of evil and violence that was in the world. So my point in all of this is, is to hopefully help you understand that while, while some people may look at the flood as, as an act of a vengeful God, I encourage you to look at the flood as one of the greatest acts of love and preservation for mankind that God has ever done. The creatures who were killed in this event were not what you and I see today or what we think of as, as being human or as being men, women, and children. And what I invite you to do is to go and look into some of the Greek mythology surrounding the chimera, which are the half-man, half-beast creatures that are represented in Greek mythology, because we're probably going to dig into some of what that means, because as we get into talking about the descendants of Noah and 
where they went and what happened with them, it's going to take us directly to the island of Crete. So if you want to kind of get a head start and understand a little bit about what's going to be coming up in the weeks to come, and also understand a little bit more about what I talked about today, go and do some research into the Chimera and into the Minotaur and the Satyr and some of the half, half man, half beast creatures that came from the Greek mythology born from the island of Crete, and you'll begin to understand this a little bit better. So hopefully, hopefully what I've done today has helped some of you guys who maybe were having a little bit of difficulty with understanding Genesis chapter 6, with understanding what are the Nephilim, what, what are these giants, what does some of this stuff mean. Hopefully that helped you out. We're going to cover some of the, more of this stuff in greater detail as we go through. I certainly appreciate you guys watching and supporting what we do. Be sure to subscribe um, if, you, if you enjoy what I'm talking about and what we're doing here. Be sure to subscribe because there's going to be some more stuff coming. Hopefully you'll think it's cool. Hopefully you'll get some revelation from it. I certainly appreciate the fact that things have been revealed to me and, and I have the ability to share those with you guys. So like, share, subscribe, and we'll see you next time. Bye and God bless.